problem, a uh, toy version of Bitcoin uh, will try to solve. So the main, the problem we'll be trying to solve is maintaining a ledger. So something like this. So the first thing is Arvin's initial balance of 200, mass initial balance of 200. So there's a bunch of things. There is transaction of the form. Matt gives Alex 50 bucks. Arvin gives Jacob 20 bucks. Jacob gives Georges 100 bucks, and so on and so forth. So we're trying to maintain this list of transactions, this ledger. And we're going to start very simple. And we're going to be removing trust and scaling up. And we'll be solving problems as they come. So problem number one, authorizing transactions. For this uh, ledger to make any sense, we should prevent things like, you know, Alex goes and writes down, Matt gave me a thousand bucks. Matt gave me a thousand bucks. So we should be making sure these cannot happen uh, without Matt's approval. Uh, the fix is going to be super simple. Crypto will do this for us. It's going to be di digital signatures. And here's Matt. <laughs> uh, so we're going to add a column that basically sets if this transaction is signed from the person who is supposed to be giving out the money. So a transaction from Alex to Georgios needs Alex's signature. A transaction from Matt to Alex needs Matt's signature. Every transaction with a signature will be called authorized. Every transaction without a signature will be called unauthorized. And it better be that whoever is maintaining this ledger only writes down authorized transactions. Just to be super clear about how you know, signing works in the crypto world, there is this known function, sign, that takes as input something like Matt gave Alex a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, and Matt's private key that Matt and only Matt knows, and outputs Matt's signature. So this is an operation only Matt can do. And then this public function verify that takes as input a signature, a public key, and the transaction, and it just tells you if indeed like this transaction was signed using this signature. And this is something everyone can do. So anyone can check without knowing math private key if uh, math signature is valid. This is basic cryptography. If you believe in cryptography, you won't have a problem with it. Good. Problem number one, solved. Problem number two, again, for this uh, list of transactions to make any sense, it must be that people are not just starting to give out money they don't have. So it can't be that Georgius starts to say, like, oh, I'm giving Matt a thousand bucks. I'm giving, you know, Jacob a thousand bucks. I'm giving Albert a thousand bucks. So this would be a huge issue if he didn't actually have that money. So we need to, to make sure we're... Not we for me. What? <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Right. So uh, notice that uh, everyone doing a tax is a Greek person. That's not <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, you know, if, we, if I just ask you to raise your hand, you're going to have a thousand different solutions to this. So, for example, one simple solution is after every transaction, have a special drive of transaction that just tells you everyone bounces. So, George just gave Matt a thousand bucks. Okay, here's a, whoever's wrote that down, write, write me to George's, George's new like, balance and Matt's new balance. We're going to do something a little closer to Bitcoin. So, what we're going to do is we're going to get another column that tells you where this money came from. So, this is a really bad thing. Oh, can anyone see this? I can barely see this. So, in this transaction where George just gave Artem a thousand bucks, we're going to add an input that says, okay, how do we know that George has actually had have, have, have this money? Look at this transaction, 133, where he got 100 from Alex, and 256, where he got another 900 from Matt. Uh, and the only thing we need to make sure is that he actually didn't spend any of this money between the earliest transaction and the current transaction. And this is something close to what Bitcoin is actually doing. One of many ways you could think of uh, solving this problem. So far, so good? Good. So now we're going to the big stuff. So if you wanted to decentralize this, so if you wanted to literally run this outside of a room where everyone is telling me what they're doing and I'm writing down transactions, uh, so somewhere across the globe, this is easy to have a trusted entity, say something we call the bank. So the bank will just maintain this ledger, we're just gonna write down transactions that come, gonna check if all the signatures are okay, gonna check if everyone has the money they're having, you can even do more things like add new people to the system and so on. Okay, but the problem specifically that will be the key problem we'll be trying to solve is what do we do without a trusted center? So what does that even mean in a sense? So if you haven't seen the solution, like, like who will maintain this ledger? And uh, if there's some dispute, who will you know decide what transactions are about it? And who will make sure there's no double spend? Um, uh, so just to give you a scenario that is not at all easy to see how we would solve. Say I want to buy a car from Matt. So Matt wants to give him this car, we agree on a price, we broadcast this transaction that says Alex gave Matt $10,000, here's a signature, great. Um, you know, everything is good, the transactions are in down, excellent. Uh, now the moment I get the keys, I just broadcast this transaction give Jacob the same amount of money. Literally the same. Right. Notice that the input is exactly the same. So this cannot happen, you know, if we're talking about actual dollars because Matt will have them in his hands. This cannot happen with the bank because somehow I have to go and convince the bank to erase the previous transaction and write down something new, which because we trust the bank, the bank will not do this. But in a decentralized, completely like, uh, in a decentralized world without a trusted center, how would you solve this problem? Okay, so this is this is this is the key problem we're trying to solve. So, so um, the way we're going to maintain this decentralized ledger is through something called the blockchain. It's a word you might have heard. So we're going to have these uh, objects called blocks, and every single transaction will be in a block. So by definition, every transaction that is valid will be in a block, and every transaction that is not valid or if it's actually not in the block, we'll be, call, we'll be calling unconfirmed or unvalid. So blocks look something like this. Block has its ID, has a pointer to a previous block, and a bunch of transactions. So here's the transaction, I'll give Matt 100 bucks with all the signatures and all the rest of the stuff. And then we're gonna have another block that points to this one with a bunch of new transactions. And then another block with a bunch of new transactions and so on that points to this one. So now it better be that whoever is creating these blocks is doing all the work for us. So they better be checking that all the transactions are valid. They better be checking that if you start from, if you look at these transactions and then these transactions, then these transactions will, which eventually like build up this ledger you have, they are not doing any funny stuff. They're not doing any double spending or so on. Good. Which brings us to our next issue is how are these blocks made? So blocks are made by these special entities we're gonna call the miners. And uh, they basically validate new transactions. They do all these things we want them to do. Validate new transactions, add them to the block, uh, add, them, add the block to the blockchain, make sure there's no funny business going on. Good. 
which again brings us to the next problem, which is how do we pick a miner? Right, so we want these miners to do all the work for us. How will we pick one? Okay, the first idea you might come up with is just pick one uniformly at random. And this is essentially what you would like to do in a decentralized unauthorized world. So say you did have some uh, external trusted source of random. So say you took pictures of the sun and then hashed the picture of the sun and that was a bunch of random bits, or something like that. So even if you could have such a nice random bit generator, recall that the environment is permissionless. That means that in principle you cannot separate between a thousand IP addresses and a thousand people. So that could be anywhere between a single person and a thousand people. Good. So users can create as many as count as they want. So these are called symbols. I think it's from a movie about uh, uh, personality disorder. And no, I looked it up <laughs> for this talk. Uh, um, great. So basically, if you did have this random bit generator, now you have essentially have a race to the bottom. So this is a race of who can create more symbols. If I'm just picking someone uniformly. Because you want to be a uh, yeah, so if I, if I said, I'm just going to, you know, uh, throw like a dice or whatever and uh, pick one of the participants uniformly random, I know all the IP addresses. Good. So now I go and I create like a million different uh, IP addresses. Now I just, you know, increase my probability of being selected by a million. And now I can do more funny business. Um, good. So this is going to be the, really the first big idea that we're going to talk about, which is proof of work. So we're going to make these miners complete, uh, compete to solve uh, something called the crypto puzzle. So what does this puzzle look like? The goal of the puzzle is for the hash of the entire text of the block plus an additional number to be in a certain range. Essentially, we want it to be like really, really, really small. So this would look something like this. SHA-256 is a very common hash function used of the entire block plus this number should be like super tiny. Um, so we're going to ask for a large number of leading zeros. And this number, very importantly, is not going to be fixed. So it's not going to be the case that you know, we're going to fix the number of leading zeros, it's going to be that forever. So in Bitcoin specifically, this number gets updated every few weeks. It's called the difficulty adjustment. And the idea is that, so notice more, more zeros means harder to find such a nonce, such a number. So the idea is to keep it to approximately one block every 10 minutes. And this will come up later. Okay, math talk when we're talking more about incentives. And there are more than this one? Uh, yes. But so the, the idea is that the hash functions are basically random. So every, uh, yes, yeah, so they're always this. This is like 250, so I think this is in the 60s and there's typically like 256 bits. bits. Has 256 bits, and the number of zeros you ask is around 60, I think. So I think the probability that it doesn't like this one is like exponentially. And uh, notice that, okay, we'll see this, uh, this will come up later, but uh, like things like transactions change and so on, so you, like, it will be extremely unlikely that something. It will be like the most amazing thing that's ever happened in the universe. Uh, okay, so again, if you believe in hash functions, uh, you should already know that the best strategy you have is to try random numbers. So there's no logic behind, you know, if you knew these, what uh, number you should try to hash to something small. This function is basically random. Okay, this is something like I guess we could debate, but if you believe in public cryptography and so on, you should just take a case out. Good. Then again, the idea is that your probability of finding a solution is proportional to your computational power. The, more, the faster you can try out these nonces, the faster you're going to solve the problem. Right? So you're more likely to win this competition. Questions? So in practice, all the, all the, all the miners are actually just doing random? I think so. Uh, yes. I mean, unless someone has found a way to like, do something smart with hash functions, in which case I imagine they're, you know, they can make a lot of money other ways than mining Bitcoin. But there is specialized hardware that just does this job much faster. But I think in essence it's just trying to um, Great. 
So we have uh, solved our first huge problem, which is how do we pick a miner to mine a block. So the first miner to solve a crypto puzzle, we just broadcast a block, and it's easy for everyone else to check if they've done anything stupid. So if they, if for example, the, the block doesn't hash to what they said they hashed, or if any of the transactions are funny, so they contain like double spending or anything like that. Okay, so if, if you see such a block, just ignore it. So that's gonna be on the policy. Good. Which brings us to our next problem, which is why would anyone do this? Uh, why would the miners you know, waste all this energy and all this computational power to try to find these blocks? The solution to that is much easier. We're just gonna reward them. So in proof of work, uh, we're gonna reward the miners in two ways. The first way is just for making the block. So every time a block is created, we're gonna basically issue new money. So we're gonna issue new Bitcoins that just go to the person that mined the block. So that's the first way we're gonna be making money. So currently, this is something like 12 and a half Bitcoin, which our current price is, is like, you know, 70, 80 thousand dollars. And recall that this is like every 10 minutes. So you're basically like, you know, throwing a postdoc's annual salary every 10 minutes at this thing. Uh, so it's a lot of money is what I'm trying to say. Um, and the second way we're gonna reward uh, miners is through transaction fees. So these are basically tips. So if uh, I'm trying to give money to Georgius, I can basically say, hey miner, here's a, a little bit amount of money, please include my transaction. So just to be super clear, this is what now our block looks like under this view. You have the block number, you have uh, you know, a pointer to the previous block, you have a bunch of transactions, you have the nonce at the end, and you have this weird transaction that says this new Bitcoin goes to yours truly, the miner. And so this is the block reward. And uh, now the transaction, you know, who gives money to whom, how much money, and all the semantics that we talked about, plus another transaction like Matt will give the miner 0.1 Bitcoins if this transaction is just clear? The idea in Bitcoin is that uh, the block rewards will start being reduced as, so and this is the only way new money gets entered the system. So the idea in Bitcoin is that the block reward will become less and less and less, and all the money will be coming from transaction fees for the miners, and this creates a whole world of incentives that Matt will talk to us about in a bit. Uh, and I guess something to remember is that you know, the whole like list, the ledger is, you know, the series of blocks, which basically means that this money does not exist if no one comes after you. Does that make sense? So if I'm looking, like if, if this money is ever usable by the miner, it better be that, you know, there are blocks after this one, that point this one. So that there are blocks such that this one is in, its, in, is in their history. And let me make this a little bit more clear, totally. Um, so here's what the network so far might look like. Call that the only you know, structural restriction we have is that every block is pointing to one other block. So in, in principle, you have the three networks. Good. So I guess what I said earlier is that the block reward for B5 you know, doesn't exist in B4. So, say as a miner, so say you decided to mine Bitcoin, and uh, you walk in and you see this uh, network, where should you mine? So which block should you try to extend? And remember, because you're using your computational power, you cannot just, you know, if you decide to do B4 and B9, that's strictly worse than doing only B9, because you're gonna waste some computational power to try to extend B4. Uh, so what does Bitcoin say you should do? Bitcoin says that you should go over the longest chain. So the true history will be the longest chain. So B9 is what you should be trying to extend. And the ledger is just the set of transactions, B1, B2, B5, B6, B8, B9. And that's the true history. And nothing else outside of it. Good. Now, say you were trying to extend B9. And you see this block, okay, you, you didn't win the race. Someone else solved the crypto puzzle faster than you. Uh, and before you, you know, you barely notice it, and then you see another block as well. So you see B10 and B11, and they are at the same height. So they are both the longest chain. And this would happen, for example, you know, either B11 was cheating, or they didn't know about B10, 
or because some natural, you know, network effects, you, this, this, this happen. So these natural forces happen. So, but as a miner, what should you do? So notice that you know a per the protocol should tell us how to resolve this issue. Otherwise, every time a natural fork like this appears, it would just persist forever, which would be horrendous. So the Bitcoin protocol tells you to just extend the first one you hear about. So if you heard about B10 first, just go with B10. Even if B11 was first, and the majority of the networks know this, just because this is a very unlikely event, it's going to resolve itself pretty quickly. So this is the idea. So it, it should be very unlikely that both B10 and B11 just get an extra block immediately, like approximately at the same time, or at the same time, like with respect to what you can see. So I'm in this little setup. So this might happen, but I'm claiming that a new block after B10 and a new block after B11 will not happen, you know, if you won't see like both pop up approximately at the same time. So you'll see something after B10, and it'll just like switch to whatever you were doing, minor top. Cool. So. So let's uh, recap what uh, how Bitcoin. Oh, here's our. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, do a quick recap of uh, how the toy Bitcoin would describe works. So how would you? What's the view of someone who is trying to make a transaction? So say I want to give Matt, uh, money to Matt. How how would we do this in this protocol? So we go on. We see this uh, this long chain. We just broadcast this transaction. So George Larkin wants to give one Bitcoin. Um, so we brought as a transaction and basically wait. So a new block comes, our transaction is not in it, that's fine. New block comes, boom, here's a transaction. Great. So now, you know, in principle, this transaction happened, but just because of these natural forks we talked about and so on, typically people wait a few blocks until they can say that for sure this transaction did happen. Right, so if I'm trying, so Bitcoin is a lot of money, so I would typically wait a bunch. So I think, uh, what's kosher with? would say it's 10 blocks, six. six blocks. So you wait approximately an hour to say that's not that can happen. And again, um, you know, a lot of, this will come up a lot from people saying, oh, well, you know, I can buy a coffee with my credit card and instantly know that the transaction happened. I can't wait an hour to buy a coffee. So is these, is that, are these cryptocurrencies any good? So this is something that I guess will come up later when we talk about practical considerations. But in principle, this is what will happen as a participant of the, uh, as a participant of the network just wants to make a transaction. Good, so what's the view of someone who wants to mine? Now this is slightly more complicated. So say this is the state of the network. B8 is the longest chain node. So as a miner, I would try to extend B8. So what would my work look like? I would try to hash a block that has a bunch of transactions that are not included in the chain so far that I have heard about. The previous block is B8, so that's the block I'm going to try to extend. And I'm going to be trying out nonce. I'm trying out nonce. I failed. Try again, fail again, try again, fail again. In the meantime, I hear a transaction. George is, is giving our bit, uh, Bitcoin. Good. I'm going to include this transaction. Keep trying. Uh, keep trying to say I lost the race. So as I'm trying this, I hear someone else saying, oh, here's B9, here's a, a point to B8. I'm like, okay, great, I lost the race. Uh, what do I do now? I remove all the transactions that B8 has. I update uh, my point of the previous block. Just keep going. Okay. So what's that's uh, that's what a miner would do in this scenario. Good. Just to be super clear, because this will be uh, this will be relevant in math part of the talk. So what a miner cannot do is force transaction transactions. So I can't just start like putting things in my block that say Arvin gave me a <coughs> block Arvin gave me. I cannot change the contents of public blocks. So I can go back and change history as a miner. And I also cannot win disproportionately often. So because computational power is not, in a sense, fakeable, I cannot win more than you know, the amount of CPUs that I have. I can win slower, but I don't know why I would do that, but I can win faster. But what can I do? So miners, and all of these will become uh, very important, so miners can choose which transactions to include. 
So if I say had like, I don't know, 90% of the computational powers, I produce 90% of the blocks, I could, if I wanted to, every transaction that I see that has mad in it, just not have it. That's something I could do. Something I could do is choose which blocks I could try to extend. So I don't have to pick the longest chain. I could, in principle, go to the beginning of time and try to start a new Bitcoin, just on my own. Uh, which also, as a sub strategy, includes choosing between uh, blocks on the same pipe. So the long build chain, I extend the shortest chain to be the longer one. What happens? How the long build chain for the transaction that you can show the longer the Right, so, uh, so the question is if I have a longest chain and then I go like 10 blocks back and start, and I do faster than the other network, then by definition, if everyone else is honest, they should keep follow me. The moment I surpass the longest chain, they should follow me. And, all this well, now we and uh, everything that happens, uh, how does this would be better with a... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. So this is a great question. Uh, so the question is, if this is what the blockchain looks like, and now I'm extremely strong, and I start doing this. I'm like, okay, I can choose to extend this block instead of this one. And somehow before like they manage to do anything about it, I surpass them. So the moment I surpass them, the longest chain protocol says that everyone else should now try to not extend this one, but extend me instead. Which by definition means that everything that happened in this range, it didn't happen. So if you sold your car here, you know, you just sold your car, they still have the big one. Right? Great, that's an amazing question. Um, right, so, and as, so as a smaller part of the strategy, this means that uh, if I did hear about this first, I can still choose to extend this one. So that's a sub-strategy of this strategy. And the last thing a miner can do, which will become relevant, is uh, choose when to announce new blocks. So I could win the crypto race, the crypto puzzle race, but I could choose to wait a little bit before I announce it. And we'll see an explicit attack why this will become relevant. Good. So, so that's what uh, toy Bitcoin looks like. Uh, ever since this was proposed, there have been some uh, very exciting new ideas. Uh, I'll briefly mention them. We'll talk about them more in detail later. So beyond single miners, so it takes. So if I open my computer now and I started uh, mining crypto, uh, bitcoins, it would tell me like, oh, you're going to mine approximately like a billion years, or something. just because of the amount of computational power in trying to solve these puzzles in the network. So what people, even if I was strong, so even if I had something like 0 0.002 percent of the total power, that would give me, if I didn't mess up my math, something like 100 blocks a year, which is serious money. This is like more than half a million dollars at current bitcoin prices. But notice that it's still 100 blocks a year. This is like the, the variance is huge. So what people do uh, to have a steady source of income is uh, join these groups called mining groups and mining pools. And the idea is that you get money proportionately to your contribution <coughs> and you'll see more in detail what exactly that means. Just as a forward pointer. Pay attention to Matt's talk more in detail if you don't know about this. Uh, so there's been some proposal beyond proof of work so in proof of work, the idea was pick a random participant proportional to their computational power. Now this, in the view of a lot of people, is very wasteful because you're just doing a lot of work for nothing, essentially. So a very prominent um, alternative called proof of stake has the following uh, variation. So you pick a random participant proportional to the total investment in the currency. So you pick them essentially proportional to how much money they have. So this is more uh, environment friendly in a sense, but the incentives, as we'll see, are also more complicated. Uh, and there'll also be another other proposals you might know, like Byzantine consensus-based approaches, which uh, I think we won't touch on today. A little bit, a little bit. Okay, we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, and also, there have been some very exciting proposals beyond currency. So notice that there was nothing special about transactions. Like we could have uh, set up a protocol like this to agree on basically anything. So there have been some, you know, 
uh, cryptocurrency specific for Apple, for, sorry, cryptocurrency proposals, application specific. So there are like specialized things that do like gambling and prediction markets and so on, using exactly these ideas. But uh, you know, as computer scientists, uh, we know that you know you don't need to do something application specific. So in principle, you could do Turing complete things, and this is the main idea behind Ethereum. So you know, Ethereum is a uh, you can agree on you know smart contracts or things that are doing arbitrarily have arbitrary functionality, and uh, I think we'll talk about um, those very briefly as well. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you.